بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد um, Respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, إن شاء الله you guys can all hear me well and the IUS um, welcomes you to the second of six webinars over three weekends that we have with um, Sayyid Hassan al-Sadr every Saturday and Sunday at 5 p.m. So for those of you who weren't able to attend last night, um, the Sayyid explained to us and illustrated um, to us the rationality behind God's existence and how there must have been a first cause and the flaw in the infinite regression. And the Sayyid also touched on the limitlessness. Um, I don't know if that's a word or that Allah is not bound to any limits and how he's absolute. And this was followed by a thorough Q&A. Inshallah, today's program will follow suit and it will be um, very similar in that there's going to be a Q&A sec um, session, inshallah, following the Sayyid's um, second talk. And as mentioned yesterday, if you do have any questions, please use your raise your hand option on the app or alternatively you can just send me um, a message or on the chat um, which is an option as well on the app and I will present it to the Sayyid on your behalf um, and if the Sayyid does ask um, throughout his talk um, if there's any questions and you do raise your hand again I can unmute you and you'll be able to do so. So a reminder that the Sayyid will, uh, the next program with Sayyid Hassan will be next week, which is Saturday, the 27th of June at 5 p.m. using the exact same link. Um, so inshallah, we'll look forward to seeing you then as well. And um, just on a side point, uh, something for the diaries, the IES has also organized a short series with Sheikh Mohammed al-Shamali over the next two Tuesdays, which is the 23rd and the 30th of June, and that will be at 8 p.m. over Zoom as well. Please just visit our website, ius.org.uk, or our social media platforms for a bit more detail on that and how to register as well. And finally, for those of you who weren't um, attending yesterday, just a brief insight and intro to Sayyid Hassan al-Sadr. Um, the Sayyid currently resides in London, where he works as a consultant hematologist. Um, he's a very strong believer in faith playing a pivotal role in developing um, societies and the importance of God centricity in solving many challenges and issues that we face today, which he touched on yesterday as well in his talk. And um, he delivers numerous programs and lectures and he likes to focus on rationality, spiritualism and activism. So without any further ado, with three loud salawats, please can you welcome the Sayyid. Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Thank you very much, Brother Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi al-Tahirin. Once again, thank you very much for the Islamic Unity Society for holding this series of presentations and discussions. And inshallah, today's topic would be divine justice, God's justice, approaching it using our defined approach, which is the rational approach. Um, a reminder to the respected audience that now more than ever people should be thinking about the God-centric paradigm, how the current world order is not serving uh, its purpose. We are unable using the current system to achieve our goals, to solve our problems, to face our challenges. And it has been the case now for generations. And the COVID-19 pandemic and the subsequent uh, economical meltdown, which we're starting to experience, 
is just another uh, wake up call, another reminder that the current system, which is self-centric, is based on uh, the person, the individual, uh, having a self-centric system in its principles and in its formation is simply not serving the purpose anymore. And therefore we are calling now more than ever for people to explore other options and in, indeed the alternative of a God-centric paradigm with new foundations, foundations that are based on a God-centric approach to life, not self-centric. Um, quick reminder, why are we using the rational approach? Why aren't we using science, even though I, I practice science uh, as part of my profession? But why we chose to um, follow the rational approach? The rational approach, as you can see on, this, on the screen, a few basic principles that are embedded within the human intellect. Um, they discover the reality for what it is, what is real and what is not. It makes sense. Everyone understands these principles and they represent the foundation of the human thinking. So it's superior to science. You need to master this before you make scientific conclusions. And in fact, scientists do use them. They use them, if I may uh, share with you the, my observation, they use them when they make their uh, scientific conclusions, not when they apply their conclusions to life. There's a big difference. You can have an observation, you make a conclusion about a relationship between two phenomena or more, but then unfortunately, some scientists, being people, they want to overstep their limits and start to uh, apply these findings uh, beyond the laboratory, beyond the studies of, of, of nature and the organism into theology. And that's where they uh, make mistakes if they don't adhere to the rational approach. A reminder of our rational conclusion from yesterday's session that we concluded that it was necessary that the first cause, rationally speaking, the first cause that is that has caused our existence, our world, to come to be, the first cause could have only been an absolutely independent higher being, was obviously intelligent and alive. He started everything. He doesn't depend on anything else. He's completely independent. And that was the key trait, the key, tra the, the key attribute upon which we started to build subsequent conclusions, rational conclusions about his attributes. First one was being absolutely independent. And subsequent to that, we established that he can't have limits, he can't have borders, he must be limitless. And we discussed how his attributes and his essence are in fact one. He can't be composed of parts, you know, essence and then other attributes attached. No, his essence and attributes are all one. So unlimited essence, unlimited attributes, he is the absolute perfection, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the absolute perfection, al-kamal al-mutlaq. And it is to him that our journey is set. Uh, the aim, for those wondering what's the aim of the creation, the religion of Islam beautifully states that the aim of the creation is to return to God, a journey to God, i.e. a journey towards perfection. God 
is the absolute perfection and our lives are simply a journey towards him. We pray that he grants us the success and continue to elevate our status towards him. We concluded using two basic principles. We concluded the existence of the independent, limitless, absolute being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using two principles, the principle of causality. We gave an example of the uh, set of domino pieces um, that for every event there must have been a cause, for every action there must have been a cause. And the second principle is the the principle of the infinite regression of linked events is false. It can only be a finite regression where something started the first um, movement, the first event, and everything else followed. So now we move on to justice a very important trait, attribute, that is the subject of extensive discussions uh, between people. Many people may believe that, okay, so I I submit, I surrender to to the reality that the world must have had a creator, but that powerful, absolute, creator show me that show me the evidence that he's fair look at what's happening to me look what's happening to the rest of the world look at the suffering the natural disasters the deficiencies in in some people look at how many criminals and dictators they get away with the injustices and the oppressions they've caused show me that this creator is fair. Demonstrate to me that he's fair, he's just. And over the next few minutes, respected brothers and sisters, we will be using the same approach, the rational approach, to demonstrate that there's only one certainty, one certainty, that the creator can only be fair. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God, can only be fair, rationally speaking. And I will be discussing a very important um, point to bear in mind. That is the common mistake of abandoning certainty for doubt. A common mistake that many people, unfortunately, Um, fall into. So let's start our discussion. Why would anyone be unfair to others? Let's, Let's try and think of the possibilities, the possible explanations. Why would anyone be unfair? Why would anyone steal? Why would anyone hurt, uh, hurt others? Why would he steal from others? Why would a dictator Uh, oppress his people, and so on. Why? The possible explanations are, number one, lack of knowledge. The individual is committing these crimes, these injustices, this form of oppression, is not aware of the consequences, not aware of uh, what his actions are leading to. That's one possible explanation. So unintentional. Um, second possible explanation is just the, the probably the most common explanation uh, is the fact that this individual who's committing these injustices actually needs something. That individual is stealing because he needs to get something. The dictator oppresses his people because he needs this form of of oppression to stay in power, to protect himself. Um, 
there's always a need for those who intentionally commit injustices. There's a need within them. And you can think of so many possible ways that this need is manifesting itself. But essentially, it's a need. They need something. They depend on that thing to, to sustain themselves, to develop, to satisfy internal desires. They need something. They depend on that thing to stay in power, the object that they stole, you know, the they, they depend on that thing that they're trying to achieve. And that's why to achieve their goal, they commit the oppressions and the injustices. Having established that the creator of our world, the Lord, his first attribute is that he can only be the creator. He can only be the first cause. If, and indeed he was, if he was absolutely independent, he can't depend on anything else. Not even borders, not even a shape, no limits, nothing. Having established that yesterday in our rational approach, then this second possibility, the common possibility of needing something, depending on something, is not applicable to him. And I think you agree with me that even the first possibility, which is lack of knowledge, uh, is not applicable to him. Because he's the creator, he started everything from nothing, then he, you know, he's aware of, of everything. So there's, there can't be a lack of knowledge. No, he is fully aware of everything that's happening within our world and within the existence. So lack of knowledge is not applicable to him, the creator of everything. And being dependent in need of something is not applicable to him. He's the absolutely, he's the absolute perfection, the independent, the limitless higher being. Effectively, we've ruled out any possible explanation, rationally speaking, of why would he be unfair. So the one certainty using the rational approach is that he can only be fair. Because rationally speaking, there's no reason for him to be otherwise. No reason for him to be otherwise. And I know that as I'm speaking about this, there are so many examples that are probably running through some people's minds of, okay, so this makes sense, but what about A, B, C, D, and E, and so on? What about all these events? What about these deficiencies? What about natural disasters? What about wars? What? I would like to ask you just, if you don't mind, just keep Keep these thoughts aside. We're about to address them. Let's agree on what rationality, rational thinking leads to. Rational thinking leads to one conclusion through the process of elimination, very simple, straightforward, that God, the creator of the world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, can only be fair because he doesn't need to be otherwise. There is no reason for him to be unfair at all. He's fully knowledgeable, with absolute power, and is completely independent. There's nothing that he would obtain from any form of injustice. And here I would like to remind the respected audience about something I've just mentioned, but I will reiterate, I would emphasize again that people commonly exchange certainty for doubts. There's only, you know, certainty has one conclusion when it comes to what we are discussing. 
And there are so many examples that create doubts in people's minds. We shouldn't be exchanging certainty for doubts. If we've established that rational thinking dictates one conclusion that we are certain about using rationality, that conclusion should not be abandoned. No matter how many examples of doubts and possibilities that contradict the certainty we come across. Effectively, what we, what we face in life is so many examples of what could be interpreted as a form of injustice. In the next slide, you will see eight explanations, eight explanations of what that event could be, of what that deficiency, what that suffering could be. None of these eights that I'm about to, do, to share with you contradict the certainty that God can only be fair. The ninth possibility is that he's unfair. So as people, we have one certainty. We have eight possible explanations for the event. What kind of event? A natural disaster, a hurricane that destroys so many lives and properties, a disease that causes loss and or suffering of people, um, and so on. All these events that are taking place around us, there are eight possible explanations of what they are. None of these eight contradict the certainty that he can only be fair. And the ninth explanation, possible, possible explanation is that, oh, this is God's work and God is unfair. Why do we choose the one explanation that contradicts certainty? Why are we tricked, I hope not frequently, to abandon the truth, al-haqq, for doubt? One, the Quran states in the one la yurni min al-haqq shay'a, or an al-haqq shay'a, I can't remember exactly the verse. But effectively, doubt, you know, you can't, doubt doesn't affect certainty. Uh, you must choose, maybe we don't know for sure which of the eight are applicable in this particular scenario. Maybe more than one of them is applicable. Um, but why do we choose the ninth one? Why do we choose the one that contradicts uh, certainty. We shouldn't. We shouldn't. So what are the eight possibilities of all these events of suffering around us? Number one, what you see in front of you is not actually injustice, it's a relative benefit. Usually this explanation is given to um, events that lead to the balance within the system, especially between different organisms. Uh, when one animal um, eats another, and you know, you may think this is just unfair um, when one organism is benefiting from the other, um, and it's just a relative benefit, it's not actually an injustice. Um, so a relevant, a relevant benefit. So one party is benefiting from the other, and, and the first part, the first party was benefiting from uh, previous one, and so on. So it's a relative benefit rather than an injustice to one of the two. Um, second possible explanation linked to the to the first one, which is balance within the system. Uh, this is how Earth is designed. This is how 
the balance between all the different factors will lead to a hurricane taking place, a storm, a volcano, um, an earthquake. It's the balance within the system. And I'm going to pause here and address a possible question that some people have. They say, well, why did the creator create a world in which it needs this one organism preying on the other or you know, the volcano to erupt to balance the system? Why didn't we have, why didn't he create a better system in which life would be perfect? No need for this balance. Well, my short answer is that he did. He did create a world or a dimension. It's a world and it's a dimension in which you don't need that balance. And we're all, God willing, heading towards that world, that dimension, uh, which is the hereafter, the real life. You know, life there is perfect. But this chapter of our journey is designed in this particular way in his infinite wisdom, this is the best way in order to achieve the full potential. And whether we are uh, the center of this uh, universe or we are not, doesn't matter. From our point of view, this system having these, uh, this form of, of, of relationship between the different parts, is sufficient for us, sufficient for us, including going through hardship and trials in order to achieve our goal from this chapter of our journey. So relative benefit, balance within the system. And no matter how much the suffering is of that disability, of that illness is in this world, it's a limited suffering. I'm not undermining the pain um, that people go through, that we all go through. But a painful experience, being patient for 20 or 50 or 60 years, if you compare it to an unlimited life of reward, of happiness, if you divide any limited number, by infinity, the value of this limited number becomes zero. If you compare 20, 40, 60 years of suffering in this world, you compare it to eternal happiness and success. And next week, in the third part of the series, we'll talk about life after death. And if you compare any suffering in this world to that infinite happiness, the value of this 20 or 60 years of suffering, Will be zero. So, of course, suffering, living with a disability, living with pain, living with disease, living with hardship is difficult, but taking the whole paradigm into account, it would have a value of zero compared to what's waiting for those who adhere to the right path, to the straight path um, in, in the journey. The fourth possibility of, um, of the suffering is that it's a test. Um, now, we don't know whether it's a test or whether it's the fifth explanation, cleansing of the sins. We don't know. Maybe that individual doesn't need to be tested like what we believe about prophets, divinely chosen people, or the divinely chosen successes, the imams, in which we will spend the last three parts of the series talking about them. Uh, they don't need to be tested, yet it's cleansing of the sins. Well, hang on a second. What, 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 prophets don't have sins according to the rational uh, approach. You're absolutely right. Therefore, it could be the sixth uh, explanation. Elevation of status. 
So an individual who is completely sin free, they will still go through hardship because that hardship would increase their faith, would elevate their status. And the journey towards the creator, who is the absolute perfection, who has no limits, has no limits. So no matter how high you go up in your status, in your rank, in your proximity to the Lord, there will be no end to that journey. No end. So even prophets go through hardship. They don't have sins. It's not about cleansing the sins. We need to be tested. People like me need their sins to be cleansed. But people like the prophets or the imams, their divinely chosen successors, their status will be elevated. So, so far, six explanations to the suffering, to the hardship. It's a relative benefit. It's a balance within the system. The suffering has a value of zero compared to life after death. It's a test, cleansing of the sins, elevation of the status. Or it could be in God's infinite knowledge and wisdom is that this suffering, or this hardship would limit my abilities to commit mistakes, uh, limits my ability to transgress, to harm others. The Quran speaks about um, the reality that if, if God was to kind of allow the people to enjoy everything and to provide them with everything, then they would transgress. And we see it. When people have a lot of power, um, a lot of potential ability to do something, they would, they would cross the line, unfortunately. So some hardship, some deficiencies are probably necessary. They're definitely necessary for us to, you know, to stay out of, uh, out of trouble. And the eighth possible explanation for what you see in front of you of hardship is that it's the direct consequences of someone's mistakes. It's a punishment. It's a punishment, something I've done to myself. Um, and therefore, it's not God to be blamed. Maybe it's someone else to be blamed. It's a crime committed by, um, by someone else. We blame it on God or we, we don't know who committed it. If we talk about the uh, changes in our environment because of pollution, well, we are to blame as humanity. We don't take measures. And I'm not talking here about the Stakeholders. No, we as consumers, we don't take measures to limit the demand on the products to stop the stakeholders from manufacturing and over, uh, over production and polluting our environment. So these eight possibilities to wrap up and, and finish the, and the presentation, these eight possibilities don't contradict the one certainty that he can only be fair. We don't know which one of them, maybe more than one of them, is applicable in this particular scenario. But it does not compromise the fact that he can only be fair. The ninth possible explanation is that God is not fair. Do not exchange the certainty with doubt. Don't fall into that trap. I hope the, I have covered most of what people wanted to uh, hear about using the rational approach. And I look forward to the questions and to the discussion that will follow, inshallah. Walhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Um, thank you very much for that. Um,
talk, Saeedna. Inshallah, we shall open um, the floor to 